what's up family and welcome back to the channel so glad to have you here hanging out with me i always appreciate you and just to be honest you know sometimes it makes it a little cooler for me because for those of you who are in the know you know that my house is burning up right now in the middle of a heat wave uh, because my air conditioner unit is out um, but hopefully that will be fixed soon uh, <laughs> But anyway, thank you for hanging out with me. Listen, we're going to have a different type of conversation today, um, which I know I always say that, but it's always true. It's always a different conversation, just like it is always a different day. I feel like there's some homespun wisdom in that somewhere. Uh, but, but anyway, today we're going to be talking about how we're going to be walking through just a few of the gods who appear in the Bible that are shared with other cultures. And perhaps I'll get to a point somewhere at the end of the video. All right, so before we jump in, please make sure to like the video, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit that alert notification bell. Consider joining our community in, 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 or, or uh, supporting our community in all the myriads of ways that you can, whether that's by connecting, whether that's by volunteering, whether that's by financially giving, uh, whether that's by commenting because that helps and sharing because that helps and liking because that helps any of those things are highly valuable and always highly appreciative uh highly appreciated and also check out the merch because we have some of the dopest merch uh in the game and i'm not just saying that you you you, you got to go check it out to, to verify all right so let's kind of jump into this conversation at one point in my overzealous Christian naivety, uh, it was completely lost on me that any of the characters in the Bible could be mentioned in other mythologies. Like, um, I remember almost thinking that there was mytho a mythological uh, reference in the Bible, right? And, and I can kind of walk you through it. It was uh, somewhere in Genesis 5, Genesis 6, might be a little later on, but uh, uh, it was a scripture that basically said, you know, these were the great and, and this is how you got the great men of renown or the great legends of old or something along those lines. And this was a situation after the sons of God came down and had an entanglement with the daughters of men mm -hmm. and they had children. And, you know, so he was like, oh, man. And in my mind as a child, you know, uh, and, it, and it's funny how, how we can do that sometimes because, you know, we still I still do it as an adult at times, too. Um, which as I've, you know, embraced critical engagement, um, catching these moments have become, has, has become paramount for me. But, but as a child, it was like, oh, legendary men of old, they're talking about Hercules, you know? And, and, and it, and it was almost like when I used to watch X-Men, like Wolverine was X-Men for me. Like that, that's X-Men. Like I was watching, I wasn't watching X-Men. I was watching X-Men. And so every time they'd have an episode that, Wolverine wasn't in it. And I'm like, how are you having an X-Man episode? An X-Man ain't in it, you know. Um, but it's like you 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 make you make uh you you make some right correlations, but you, you kind of miss some of the broader point. And so as a child, I said, Oh, Hercules. And then at first that was like a very exciting thing. It was like, oh man, this is so dope. You know, the Bible's talking about Hercules, and Hercules like was one of my favorite shows at one point, the Kevin Sor Sorbo version. And I was like, holy snap, this is so dope. Um, what was this thing? Eolus or something like he had a sidekick and they introduced the uh, Lucy Lawless Xena during this time as well. And so, you know, it was a lot of things going on in my mind. And I was just like, oh, this is so dope. You know, the Bible became very interesting to me for a few minutes in that moment. But then like the more I dwelt on that and I was like, oh, no, wait a minute. But if that was the case, if the Bible is telling me about Hercules, and I know Hercules is mythology, then, ooh, you know, but, for, you know, I, what's, I was, I was going to say fortunately, but actually, unfortunately, I was able to soothe myself as in, into this idea that, no, you had kind of got it wrong. And, and that wasn't wrong. I did get it wrong. Um, I, I got it close to right, but I didn't get it wrong. Uh, the wrong part uh, was that no, this was likely not talking about Hercules, you know, but it was talking about characters in the same class of Hercules or the same category of Hercules. And that is the class of demigods, you know. Um, and so, you know, this is like, like the origin story of, of demigods. And that's a whole nother other situation right there. 
uh, because then even when you look at Jesus, Jesus is like a demigod. He, he's, he's, he's Hercules, you know, Hercules. All right. So, but somehow I had convinced myself that the Bible was an isolated truth and could have absolutely nothing in common with the false religions of pagan cultures. Cringe, right? I know, I know. Um, it turns out that the Bible mentions several deities that are also found in other myth mytholo uh, mythologies and cultural pantheons. And so, no, younger Durante, the Bible didn't mention Hercules. Or maybe it does somewhere, and I'm overlooking it now, but there was definitely not a direct reference to Hercules. But there are a few other direct references and quite a few to other gods that we can learn more about through from the pantheons that they belong to. So let's walk through a few notable deities and divine figures mentioned in the Bible that appear in various ancient mythologies. We're going to we're going to start with one that that's pretty well known. Uh, it's probably not the most known, but we're going to start with Baal or Baal or Baal, however you want to say it. I don't care. It's fiction to me. So um, to give you a little the cultural context of Baal is uh canaanite and phoenician so we find we find and, and there there's quite a quite a bit of a uh, heavy correlation and relationship between the canaanites and the phoenicians in the same way that there is like heavy relationship between the canaanites and the people who become the hebrews um just in different ways but they shared this god so canaanites phoenicians and um, the early Hebrews shared this knowledge of this entity uh, who shared the label of Baal. You know, uh, in the Bible, we see frequent references to Baal, uh, typically as a bad guy. Um, in Judges chapter 2, verse 13, first, first Kings chapter 18, Hosea chapter 2, verses 8. Um, and, and Baal was a, a storm and fertility god in Canaanite religion and was often seen as a major rival to Yahweh in, in the Old Testament. Uh, so in the Old Testament, he's a rival to Yahweh. But when you actually study the pantheons that Baal belongs to, it becomes quite clear while they, why they are ri rivals. And I think uh, Derek Lambert over on Myth Vision does great work in kind of highlighting a, a, a lot of what those relationships were. Here... I just want to walk through the list a little bit. Uh, but but man, when you do explore the relationships, it is so interesting. And it's just like, oh, this makes so much sense now. It's like, th this is like, hmm, like reading the Bible and just taking that as the full story is, is like, it's like reading a book that's an epic narrative. You know, and only, you know, and only picking one chapter out of it to define the characters. Nope, these characters have histories that predate the Bible, which that has a lot of implications on its own. And I, I'm not even going to go there right now, but maybe later. Uh, you also have Asherah. You know, this is a, another one that I don't know why, like as many times as I saw that name in the Bible, it never, never clicked to me what was going on. And, and. Hoy, but and of course she's uh, she's mentioned in Judges six, First Kings eighteen, uh, and Ash Asherah was considered a mother goddess and consort of El. All right, El. Now you Bible scholars should know who El is, or even you Bible students, you know you should know who El is. Um, El was the head of the Canaanite pantheon, the head of the Canaanite pantheon. All right. Um, and Asherah is his consort, you know, kind of like wife is pretty much what that is. Um, and she's frequently mentioned in the context of her poles being set up beside the altars to Yahweh. And that's, that's in scripture. Now, again, she has a story much like Baal does or Baal or however you say it. Um, she has a story. They have stories that predate what's written in the Bible. You know, you have Malek, you know, which I always thought that name was all, always funny. And um, this God was uh, was an Ammonite God. And the Bible doesn't, you know, necessarily sh shoo away from that. 
Um, but you know, you know, and again, this again, and I've already called out my naivety as a child and as an overzealous Christian at, at one point. But as many times as I had saw these names in the Bible, like the Perizzites, the Ammonites, the uh, Canaanites, you know, the Jebusites, it had never really occurred to, uh, occurred to me until actually deconstructing and de uh, well deconstructing to start actually saying, hmm maybe I should go learn about these other cultures from sources that are not uh, biased by the Bible, you know? So like there's historical sources on Canaanite ideologies, Canaanite uh, beliefs, Canaanite culture. There, there are historical sources for uh, who the Ammonites were, what they did, um, you know, and kind of how they lived and, and, and many things like that. And so um, and of course, not for everybody mentioned in the Bible, but for many, there are these groups that that exist. And I was allowing my my whole opinion of these cultures to be shaped by this uh, worldview that, you know, El, El is the good God or Jehovah is the good God. And all of the other gods are bad and all of the other people are bad because of the reasons that are said in this book, uh, which kind of gives you this kind of enables you to determine that anybody who's writing anything about these people outside uh, of this book are liars. You know that that, of course, they'd say that they're God haters. And that that's so sad, but that 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 unfortunately is often the view of, of many believers. I can't say most for sure, um, but there's enough for me to be able to say many of many believers that if anybody is saying anything differently than what is reflected in the Bible, then that person must hate God, because why else would you do that? All right. So Malek is an uh, Ammonite God mentioned in Leviticus, Kings. Uh, was a god associated with 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 child sacrifice, unlike Jehovah, I guess, who sacrifices his own child and also encourages other people to do so. Uh, particularly known, uh, Malek was particularly known for receiving burnt offerings of children, which was strongly condemned in the biblical text, except for when God says do it, then it's okay. Or, or Jehovah, Adonai, you know. Uh, there's Dagon, Dagon, Dogon, um, who comes from Mesopotamian and Philistine pantheons and cultures. You know, like, I wonder how they saw Dagon. You know, it's like, you just don't realize you're getting a one-sided story about so many characters that becomes your absolute worldview of these characters and the cultures they represent while absolutely ignoring the the same flaws that exist within the god that we've chosen to identify as supreme you know uh but dagon was a a major northwest semitic god often associated with fertility and agriculture and um and after uh and after contact with the mesopotamians was adopted by the philistines you know so dagon is Dagon is older than Jehovah. And, and that's the, that, that's the, that's probably another part of the, the thing is that when you, when you read the story or you start getting all of the stories together to get a more, uh, a more clear view, you realize that Jehovah's the new guy. <laughs> Jehovah's the new guy to the party. He was the late bloomer. He showed up late. He's not, he ain't been here this whole time, you know? Um, and much of the story, you know, that that's, you know, presented in the, in the, in the Hebrew Bible is, try, you know, is, is basically his way of saying, you know, or, or the people's way of saying he's the new guy and he's better than everybody else. And he's so much better than everybody else that nobody else actually even really exists because he's just that damn good because that's how the story reads. Like when you're reading the story, it goes from, hey, yeah, there's these other gods who exist. And then finally, you know, when when Yahweh is kind of coordinated after after this you know, made up Egyptian fiasco. It's like, nah, nobody else exists no more, you know? And it's just like, oh, okay. Cause I'm just that good, you know, but I, you still call me the most high though, but there's nobody else out there to compare me to. Yikes. Right. Uh, so you, you can immediately tell that Je Jehovah's adherents were not that bright.
Um, they, they, they did not catch on. Um, there's also Tammuz, um, Sumerian roots, uh, later Mesopotamian as well, um, mentioned in Ezekiel 8. But here's the thing. One of the one of the the most the most funny things about the Bible is uh, many of these gods, kind of like Asherah, uh, in many cases, many of these gods show up in the Bible. There are some that show up directly, but many of them there's like when you look at how many gods show up indirectly. Uh, not I mean, and it starts with like literally with Genesis chapter one verse one. Um, that that story when you actually get into the context of the words that are being used. It's a mythological story, and 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 and, and, and there are more there are more than one gods at play. And I'm not just talking about the Elohim; I'm talking about literally the void that's being mentioned, and the um and 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 the earth that is with sorry the earth that is without form or void. Um, all of these things have when you actually look at the word, just like oh well, yeah, this is actually this, this is actually this, and then and in that way, the Bible does read very much just like any other myth mythological books from its time. And then you kind of see, you know, from Genesis, perhaps through, uh, from Genesis, perhaps through the judges, and, and I'm kind of being modest here. Um, this is a whole story of this, this God, uh, or, or these, these people determining kind of which God gains supremacy. And, and, and it begins by this, the Elohim's, or Elohim character, whether that's plural, plural or singular, is debatable amongst lines. But the Elohim character is, the, the Genesis 1-1 is actually a triumph. Um, and some believe that that triumph is over a, another one of those fallen gods. Um, so, but uh, Tammuz is also known as Dumuzi Dum in Sumerian mythology and was also a god of fertility and agriculture deeply associated with the cycle of seasons and vegetations. And, and, and I, I want you to, you to see that you will likely uh, see that this is a, um, that this is a theme that many of the gods who are mentioned in the Bible have the same type of roles. And so, and so, and then the, the, the competitive aspect kind of starts to make more sense because they're all agricultural storm and fertility gods, you know? Um, and someone say, but you just said to was, you didn't mention storms. He's a cycle of seasons. That's, that's storms. Um, but then, um, so we'll kind of keep going. There's, uh, Ashtoreth also, uh, or, or Astarte. And, and, and I started to, to, to not mention this one separately, uh, as uh, Ashtoreth can can be conflated with um, Asherah. And, and I say that only to say that, you know, all gods are conflations for the most part. Um, it, it, it's all conflations. You know, it, this is this has been an ancient practice uh, with gods that you merge gods with similar aspects or you merge gods when people groups come together. Uh, Amun-Ra is, is an example of that. Um, but but Ashtoreth here um, is also Canaanite and Phoenician, just like uh, Asherah. Um, the difference is Ashtoreth uh, was the consort of Baal, Baal, um, while um, Asherah is the consort of El, you know. And, and, and it's almost, you know, to me, to me, and it's just my little opinion here, you know, the difference between El and Baal in many cases uh, is probably similar to the difference between Ra and Re, or Amun and Amen, you know, um, or El and Allah, um, in the sense that these are people who are telling similar stories, who have shared mythologies, uh, but are telling those stories in the context of their own language and the context of their own social situations. And then uh, as they begin to uh, interact with each other, um, they either merge these identities or what we see happening in the Bible, there begins to be battles for supremacy, uh, which is, you know, the gods are always a reflection of people and what the people are battling for. And so Ashtoreth was, you know, consort of Baal, um, and she was also much like Asherah, goddess of fertility, love, and war. 
Um, there's Chemosh, you know, it, it doesn't get mentioned as much, but he was the national deity of the Moabites, uh, occasionally referred to in the Bible as a God who supposedly gives his land to his worshipers. Unlike Jehovah, promised land. Hello. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and he was Moabite. There's Hadad, Hadad, Hadad. Um, Hadad, Canaanite, mentioned indirectly um, through kings um, named after him. Uh, Hadad was another name for Baal, uh, representing the storm god aspect. Um, and then, you know, one of my favorite mention, you know, because as, as a person, you know, who went through the black consciousness phenomenon, I was never uh, what they call a hotep uh, per se. Uh, but but it was a fascinating period for me, and, and I, I do mention it in my upcoming book. Uh, but Anubis, Egyptian, obviously, uh, mentioned directly as part of the plagues in a symbolic sense against uh, the Egyptian gods in Exodus. Uh, Anubis, of course, is not directly mentioned by name, but is part of the Egyptian pantheon, uh, pantheon as a god of mummification and the afterlife relevant during the narrative of the plagues where Egyptian gods were symbolically defeated. And then there is Nebu, Nebu, who is also Egyptian. Um, what, what, there is a, is it DC? Yeah, a DC comic character that's based on Nebu, Nabu, Nebo, Nebo. Um, Dr. Myst no, Dr. Fate, that's him. The helmet he wears is, is, is Nebu. Uh, but Babylonian, it also has some uh, some Egyptian inferences to it as well, um, but as a god of uh, wisdom and writing, uh, venerated uh, particularly um, in, in Borsippa. Uh, but you can find mention of Nebu in the Bible or Nebu in Isaiah 46. Um, of course, there is El, you know, and yes, El. El was a Canaanite god before El was a Hebrew god. El was the supreme god of the Can uh, Can Canaanite pantheon, uh, which can also be called Elohim, known as the father of gods and humans, often depicted as a wise, compassionate, and venerable patriarch. Um, the Hebrew Bible adopts El in various compound names and attributions such as El Shaddai, El Elyon, uh, and El Alam, but also Israel, and uh, many of the other names that you see in the Bible, Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel, all of those ILs are a, um, are a, uh, um, oh, what am I trying to say here? It's a nod towards, you know, being of or, or related to or in relationship with this particular deity, you know? Um, so, and, and this deity had like, before the before the Bible claims him as you know their their own, which it barely does that right. The story actually doesn't claim El as their as its own. It just kind of opens up with El, but it quickly shifts to 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 Jehovah, you know, or Yahweh. Um, you know, when we're reading it without the English uh, generic version of God everywhere, there's a name. <laughs> Um, and, and that's what these are at this moment. It, it's name. Like, imagine reading um, the Greek, or imagine reading Greek mythology where everywhere there was Zeus or, or Hera, and I don't know if these are the Greek ones or not, but Zeus or, or Hera or, or whoever the hell else, you know, it just said God, you know, or, or imagine reading Egyptian or Kemetic uh, mythology and everywhere um, where it said, where it reads Amun or Anubis or Thoth or Osiris, you know, or, or, or Aset, you know, or Isis uh, or Osar, Osiris um, or, or Ptah, you know, if it just said God, like this is incredibly misleading and you're not even really getting a good story. Um, and and that, that's probably one of the reasons that the Bible is incredibly uninteresting is because of that aspect. All right. Okay. So anyway, but El, you know, Supreme God, El Elyon, um, Reshef is another one. 
uh, also a Canaanite and Egypt, uh, also part of the Canaanite and Egyptian uh, mythologies. Reshef was a god of plague and healing, showing the dual aspects of harm and protection. Uh, he was venerated extensively in Egypt as well, demonstrating cross-cultural relationship. Uh, Reshef is mentioned in Habakkuk 3.5, where translations often render the term as plague or pestilence, indicating his destructive aspect. And again, that's that those are some of those points where I say again in, this, in, 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 in the Bible where the, the names are being mentioned of these other gods, the translators are, are turning them into um, verbs, <laughs> you know, type of thing. But um, next there is Beelzebub. And this one, he makes it into the New Testament too. Um, but Beelzebub comes from Philistine mythology. Uh, later, uh, Judaic and Christian traditions, you know, adopted him. Um, but originally, it was likely a, a title of a deity known as Baal, in the same way that we add the El, Baal Zebub, uh, Zebub, or Baal the Prince, ruler of Ekron. You know, over time, Beelzebub somehow became associated with demons or the devil in Jewish and Christian demonology. Uh, which we, which is how we see it mentioned in the uh, in in the New Testament, um, he's equated with Satan, uh, illustrating his evolution into a symbol of evil. Um, and then the, the hit this last one is El Elyon. Um, this one comes from the Canaanite pantheon as well. Again, El Elyon means Most High, and is often used in conjunction with El in the Bible, denoting a supreme god. Um, and frequently uh, appears in the Old Testament, such as in Genesis, where God is described as El Elyon. Um, but I always remind people that if there, if 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 a God describes itself as the Most High God, then that God is inferring the existence of other gods. And because these other gods show up in the story, you know, like I want to know who they are. I want to know their story. Tell me who hurt you. What's your motivation? You know, um, so before I close this out, I want to highlight two concepts that were very influential um, while I while I was a believer, because it's not just the, the characters, but there's also concepts in the Bible that, again, predate the Bible. Um, one of those concepts for me was Numa, the Numa, the spirit of God, the the the, the breath of God, the air of God. In ancient Greek thought, particularly among Stoic philosophers, Numa was the vital spirit, breath, or creative force uh, that infused life into matter. Uh, Stoics believe that Numa is the reason or force that binds all elements in the universe together, acting as the source of life and rationality in all beings. And that is just a wonderfully beautiful thought. And there are aspects in scripture, especially in the Old Testament, where that does seem to be the idea and the, 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 the equivalent word, uh, and I don't know if equivalent is safe to use, but it's the best word I got for now. The equivalent word for, num for, for the Greek pneuma in the Old Testament is ruach, which basically kind of has that same connotation of, of, of it's just breath. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the connotation of agency and being something, you know, um, that's actually controlling things, uh, but more so kind of like the divine spark, if you will. Um, it's only our presuppositions that, that we take the scriptures for the Old Testament that we can view the Ruach as, as this identity of God and the Holy Spirit. Um, and in the same way, you know, Numa uh, in, its, in its original concept is also like that. Um, but of course, in the New Testament, it does get coupled with this ideology about a Holy Spirit, about the Parakletos. You know, ooh, I should have added the Parakletos to this list. Uh, Parakletos, sorry. Um, but uh, but Numa was the vital spirit, breath, and creative force. So you know, it's not necessarily doesn't have to be spooky. I think it was spooky for many, but it doesn't have to be spooky. It's literally this thing that all living things share, you know, um, but this is how it existed for, for this moment before Christianity kind of adopted it, you know, and the, the problem is, and I don't blame the writers of the Bible for this, nor do I, I, I nor do I blame the, the crafters of the, uh, the, the crafters of what becomes the canon for this, uh, nor do I blame the people who did all of the translations. Nope, you know, for, for this, I, I more so prob 
blame the preachers and how we've just kind of presented these things w without research the preachers from, from from my circle so you know i can't talk about the ones from your circles um um because it was very naive of me to to think these things but i really thought like oh numa this is a christian thing you know it didn't ex it didn't it didn't like it didn't like i said it was lost on me that that these words could have actually been used before this book was written and that these words could have had ideals uh that were attached to them you know now when i look at it it's kind of fascinating um but Numa was considered the breath of life that animates the soul of every living being and was closely linked to the concept of Logos, you know, as the ordering principle of the universe, which we're going to come back to Logos. Um, you know, I kind of talked about Ruach. So, nope, let's talk about Logos. Um, this was initially introduced by uh, Heracl Heraclitus. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Heraclitus. Um, but Logos uh, was conceived as the principle of order and knowledge. Uh, Heraclitus posited Logos as the underlying structure of reality, governing the cosmos and underlying the constant change. Uh, Plato and Aristotle further developed this idea linking Logos to reason and intelligence, which they believe were the underlying principles guiding the universe and human behavior. The Stoics also emphasized Logos as the rational divine principle that organizes the cosmos and is presented in the individual human soul as the source of wisdom and virtue now if anything like reading that like and, and talking through this and thinking about that it's really it's really a shame what christianity kind of did to logos because in christianity the logos is just the word and the word is jesus and so you take this very sophisticated thought process that is trying to wrestle with the complexities of life. And sure, it doesn't get it 100 percent right, but it's wrestling with the realities as it experiences it. And, and th th these are the the idea of logos was incredibly sophisticated. And, and so for for Christianity to take and to say, no, logos is the word. It's the word of God. It's the Bible. And it's Jesus. The Logos is every word that God speaks. The, word, the Logos is also the words that Paul and Peter Nim said. And it is literally Jesus in the flesh. All of those things is the Logos. That's quite complicated, but nowhere near as sophisticated. Right? Uh, like these ideas I could appreciate. And, 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 and truth be told, if, if Christians... If Christianity would have dealt with Logos in good faith, then maybe it would have led them to a better faith. Damn, those were bars. Okay. All right, let's roll. Um, so, yeah, so lo Logos was a thing. Logos was a thing for me. Um, th the big point of all of this is that the words, concepts, and characters used in the Bible have a history that predates it. Uh, many of these characters have roots in other cultures and mythologies, which means viewing them from the Bible alone gives us no real insight into where these characters come from or even how they came into being. And even as I demonstrated uh, in this conversation, we have to understand that the Bible is a very biased book, um, as will the other stories be. So the other stories, when they mention El, they may not have good things to say. Um, but I think we've learned that a way of getting to better understanding is trying to get all the sides, right? Um, and if we're inclined to care about the whole story, whether from an academic perspective, um, a, a literary perspective, or just a, just a curiosity in, in, in history and mythology, then we should be careful to follow the story arcs across all the pages of the story, even if that means having to explore an unfamiliar culture. Um, which I think is a challenge that we should all be open for and open to. So I hope you've enjoyed this little diatribe that I've had. I don't know if I'm using that word right. I got to refresh myself. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I hope you, you all have enjoyed this time that we've shared together. I hope I've said something that has those wheels spinning uh, and maybe if something that, that's either piqued some curiosity or generated some some sense of value um, for you. If I have, please let me know in the comments. And so with that being said, please make sure 
like the video, hit the alert notification bell, su subscribe to the channel. I did that backwards this time. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, consider joining our community and check out our merch. And until next time, man, keep rising, stay progressive, and stay absolutely beautiful with your gorgeous self. I love y'all. I'm out.